Hey, Paola. Hello, Father. Hey, this is Roy Like the Lamb. I'm Father Sam Kachuba. And this is Paola Pena. I'm going fishing today. Oh, of course you are. It's a beautiful day. It's also, a great day to get out and do that. Yesterday was wait. disgusting. Well, yesterday... All right, you're right. It wasn't a great day. No, yesterday was gross. But I'm real happy about this. It's going to be fun. Yeah. Yeah, Dad's in town, so we're going to go hang out with Dad and, and go fishing. So I learned that there are people down south, because they do interesting things down there, they will actually go catfishing, but with their arm. Yeah. Like, it. it I watched this girl do this, and she just was underwater for like a good couple minutes. And I was like, did she die? And there she is just holding a catfish. Yeah. I didn't realize they're that big. Oh, yeah, catfish. They're monsters. Yeah, yeah, they're huge. And there she is just coming out of the water, smiling, all cute and stuff. And I'm like, girl, you got a catfish literally around your it's, forearm. It's attached to your arm now. Yeah. yeah, like she put it through the gill and then her fist was coming out of its mouth. Oh, gosh. And you can't see anything because the waters are nasty. Would you ever do that? Go that kind of fishing? Go fishing with my arm? Um, I'd have to learn how to do it. But you'd be open to I, it. I'd be willing to try. Yeah, sure. Why not? Nah. I mean, it, it, it's the kind of thing like, here, this is, this is something that we're going to do, so give it a shot and see what happens, and why, why not try it? Mm. I've always seen the, the people who just go fishing in the pond, they just like, reach their hands. And, okay, well, that's cool. And they, they catch the fish just okay. barehanded. I think that's really cool. Yeah, so that is really cool. Why not use the whole arm, I mean, to catch a really big fish? I think just freak out about a very monstrous-sized fish. I don't think catfish have teeth, though. I don't I, know. I could be wrong. But this girl was bleeding, so I don't I don't really know what was going on. I'm sure it was her blood and not the catfish's blood from no, like, no, punching it, was, it in the head? No, no, because then she showed you her arm. Oh, okay. And and I'm just, I was like, you do this for fun. <laughs> hey, man, what, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Yeah, so that's cool. Yeah. Well, today's a beautiful day for that. It's a good day for it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, so tonight, I mean today. Tonight, today, whatever. This morning. Hey, nobody who's listening knows when we record this. They're not. Now, and they usually now we're listen. telling them. Now we're revealing our secrets. We, <laughs> we can't be so revelatory. Nine in the morning on Thursdays. <laughs> this is when this happens. Uh, I want to talk about heaven. 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 Let's do it. And the reason why I want to talk about heaven, I did this discussion with our young adults that I'm going to do with our high schoolers. And what I realized is how often we don't contemplate heaven enough. Well, yeah, for sure. We don't. Uh, think about it. And, and that has to do with also recognizing our desire for heaven. Because mm-hmm. uh, when you get caught up with the things of this world, you just get so bombarded by earthly things. And when things get hard, um, that's when you're struggling with faith and hope and all of that. It's because we've lost sight of heaven. And, and then when you think about heaven, the times that I've contemplated heaven, I've contemplated my place in heaven your soul is filled with joy and this joyful expectation, this hope. And I'm like, why can't I be in this state 24 seven? And it's a gift. And it's such a, it's like a refreshment to my heart Mm. when I contemplate it. And I'm like, I just take a deep breath. And I'm like, this is what it's all about. This is what church is all about. This is what living in this world is about is I need to have my heart in heaven. It's easy for us to not have that focus, though. Because, oh, yeah. like you said, we get caught up in all the stuff going on around us. We get caught up in worldly stuff. And so it's hard sometimes to to have that sense of, I am oriented to heaven. Mm. The whole purpose of my life is, is to get to heaven. And, and my whole ultimate goal is to get to heaven. Yeah, It's kind of fun to set those those little goals along the way to say, all right, I want to do this. This is my five-year plan, right? Those those are all good things. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's nothing nothing bad about that kind of stuff. But... Sometimes in in the day to day, we're not really thinking about how what I'm doing right now, uh, my actions, my choices, my words, how that will impact my eternity. Right, and yeah. even when we were in mass, right, like you are stepping in, like heaven has come down to you. And if all of us had this mindset that we are going to mass oriented to heaven, but that heaven has come and touched down. Like that just changes your whole experience of mass. For sure. Doesn't matter what the music sounds like or whatever the homily was, like just the mere fact. And I had this hap this experience happen a couple years ago where my favorite mass was a daily mass where there was no music. It was like done in 20 minutes. But it wasn't because of that, but because in that moment I actually, right before mass, I asked the Holy Spirit, um, Holy Spirit, teach me how to pray this mass. Mm. Help me to enter into this mass. And whoa. Like I just started crying. Because my, the eyes of my heart, they began to just, it was unveiled the reality of what I was doing and what I was stepping into. 
I remember this, this one part as I'm praying through the mass, all of a sudden, every word that I was saying had meaning and it was so precious. Mm. And it was just like, I was repeating like, like a poem, but my heart was so into it. And as we just continued to go through the mass, I was able to see heaven. Like I am right here worshiping with the angels and saints. Yeah. And I just teared at the, at the, the beauty in the magnificence of what the mass is that I am in worship with all of heaven yeah. right now. And again, there was no music. There was nothing. It just was so simple that my heart, thanks to the Holy Spirit, opened my eyes as to what worship was in yeah. this moment. Well, ultimately, that's the whole purpose of, of the celebration of the mass yeah. is to transport us to heaven, to give us that, that foretaste of heaven here on earth. We don't always realize it. We don't always experience it. Sometimes that's because of the way that Mass is celebrated or just the, the mood that we're in on a given day. But even if we aren't subjectively aware of the fact that Mass transports us to heaven, mm-hmm. objectively, that's what's happening. Right, right. You know? And I was in a mood before this Mass. Yeah. I, I want to preface that. I wasn't really well, so feeling that, it. That's a special grace that you receive because going in and, and making that yeah. prayer, it's the Lord answering that prayer right away for you to say, yeah, I want you to experience this yeah. sense of, of the heavenly reality. I want you to see mm-hmm. what's really going on here. Yeah. Um, there's those little cartoons that you'll see, or even even there's there's master paintings of, of this, but there's also little like cartoons that you'll see in, in catechism books uh, that says what, what you see, and it shows a picture of the priest saying mass, mm-hmm. like a, a very simple sort of altar, the priest, oh. and then it says what's really happening, and you see all these angels and saints yeah. kind of surrounding it, and they're labeled you know angels, saints, <laughs> uh, <laughs> case people needed you exactly know. just just to make sure that you know what's going on, but yeah. there's there's a, a real truth to that. Yeah, when we start to open our eyes to to recognize what's happening the mass, that can point us more towards heaven. Um, and maybe that's why we don't think about heaven often enough, because we don't realize what the mass actually is, mm-hmm. what's really happening when, when, we're, when we're standing before the altar, kneeling before the altar, that, that the Lord is, has made himself present. He's brought heaven to earth for us. Mm-hmm. If maybe we were able to enter more deeply into the mystery of what's happening in the sacred liturgy, that might help us to understand better that heaven is something that should be on our mind every day. Yeah, yeah. But we struggle too because we're broken people. Are we? I don't know. I think <laughs> sin is a problem. Last time I checked. It remains. Yeah. All right, so here's my first question. All right. What sort of internal reaction do you have when you think of eternity? When I think of eternity, yeah. Um, I'll be really honest, the first thing is sort of like I catch my breath. Mm-hmm. Just the idea of eternity. Forever and ever and ever. There's, there's, this, <laughs> there's this sort of like... That's a long time. It's <laughs> <laughs> a really long time. And, and, and I don't, there's also a sense of wonder, like a very positive sense of wonder. Mm-hmm. What is it going to be like? Mm. What is eternity like? What is that time outside of time? Mm. That time beyond time, right? What What is that? What is it like? So there's a, at the same time that I'm sort of catching my breath, that sense of, of wonder and and with that sort of a, I want to see it. Mm. I want to experience it. Um, but there's also the, you know, as I think this is my, it's because I'm Catholic. <laughs> it's because I'm Catholic. It's because I've, I've studied theology. You know, I also start to think, all right, eternity, long time, then I'd like to see it. I'd like to experience it. And then the realization that there are, there are different ways of experiencing that eternity. Mm. And one is very good and one is very bad. Mm. That eternity is, is either that experience of, the constant presence of God and his peace and consolation and the knowledge of security, or it's that constant isolation and separation from God, which is despair and suffering. And I immediately know, as I think of those things, I know what I want. Mm. I know what I want. And I know that it's not, it's not that hell of (laughs) of suffering. I am very confident in what I want. I choose option A, please. Yes. (laughs) Please close the door on option B. Uh, didn't Padre Pio, someone told us at the young adult group, said that he feared not entering into heaven? I think that that should be the, the fear that we all have. So a, a, an, an appropriate fear. Right. right? We can have a, a sense of confidence that God's mercy is there for us. We can have a sense of confidence that by our faith in Jesus Christ, we're, we're going to have salvation. Like, there's no reason not to believe that and, and not to plan for it. Like, we should be planning on getting to heaven. But mm-hmm. at the same time, like, I'll, I'll very positively plan for heaven. 
and it, I intend to go there. That, yeah. That's what I want. But listen, when I die, you need to make sure that masses are said for my soul <laughs> and you need to pray for my salvation and you yep. need to pray me out of purgatory because I know that I need to spend time there and I need you to pray for my salvation. Like, don't ever think that just because I'm, I'm a priest and, and I say mass that I'm, I'm good and I don't need anything just because I'm planning on heaven. Please realize <laughs> I need your prayers to get me there. So that's one thing I just want to make sure now it's, now it's recorded. I've got to make sure that I get this in, in writing in other places too so that, that people will know. But that's the plan. Yeah. Right? Like I can plan for heaven and be very confident that God's mercy is so great and that I am doing everything in my power to to cooperate with God's plan, with God's grace. And I know that God's grace is always abundant and is always there for me. So I can rely with great confidence on that and have faith that, yes, I, I believe in Jesus. And I believe in the power of his cross and resurrection. I believe that I am saved and I believe in all of that stuff. And at the same time, I know that my actions and my stupidity very much can get in the way. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so I plan on heaven. Yeah. That's that's my desire. That's yeah. that's where I want to be. But I also want people to, to be ready to pray for me when I'm when I'm gone. So Father Benedict Rochelle, um, I heard him speaking at a conference in Vermont. He is the I think he was one of the founders of the one Fran- of the founders of the Franciscans of the Renewal. Yeah. yeah. So CFRs, and he said, "Listen, folks, my uh, my goal is just to make it a purgatory." <laughs> But the great thing is when you make it to purgatory, you know where you're going. Yeah, yeah. In case I miss, I'd like to land in purgatory right, so right. that can I know at least I'm guaranteed heaven. Right. Uh, okay, that's that's really cool. When I was a kid, I have this memory of um, thinking about eternity, and I would gasp, but because I was like my breath would just I had to take. It was hard to breathe because it was just too overwhelming. Yeah. When you think of eternity, it, there's like this. There's fear that's like, well, how? And you think of space, it just goes and goes and goes. Like, how can heaven just go and go and go and go? Um, and I would be gripped by this fear. This, this, just even thinking about it would just. It was. It wasn't very. It wasn't very good. Um, and then you learn about the concepts of heaven and hell as a child, and you're just like, what? It's, it's, it's a lot to handle um, intellectually, but then also how that kind of transfers to you emotionally. It's like, well, uh, it's kind of scary. Um, but I remember the first time I started thinking about heaven wasn't until, like, and I mean seriously contemplating heaven, like really like entering into a prayer because a priest told me to pray a specific scripture passage in the Bible And the word heaven popped up, and it was in the story of the young rich man. So he had me read that for confession. This was five years after my initial yes to Jesus. And I remember sitting in adoration as I'm reading this this passage. I'm not sure why he gave it to me. And heaven popped up. Like the word just popped up. And then the Holy Spirit had me just meditate on the word heaven. And I just, I busted out in tears. I was like, oh my gosh. You cry a lot. I cry a lot. And you know what? I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that because that's how I pray. But the overwhelming sense of the reality of heaven that started taking root in my heart. I, I might have known that intellectually and I and I heard about it and, and I, I had already begun to know Jesus' love for me. I'd begun to know the Father's love and I'd begun to know the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. Um, but there was still a lot of me that couldn't see that image perfectly, obviously, um, coming up with like brokenness and learning how to heal. Uh, but now this idea of heaven began to take root mm. and really began to uh, just be the foundation of what my life is supposed to be like. And I believed in it. I think this was different because now I believed in heaven. This is five years after saying yes yeah. to Jesus. But it, um, it, it, can, it, it can take a while to, to recognize the the eternal consequences of that act of faith. Yeah. You came to a place where you said yes to Jesus and to following him, and it started to change your life in a practical way. Mm -hmm. You started to realize that there was a a deeper sense of peace and and spiritual fulfillment in your life. But it was only by going through that process that you started to realize that this spiritual fulfillment that I'm feeling now and that I've been practicing actually has an eternal component Mm -hmm. it's not only for this life a lot of times we look for we look for the consolation for the tangible sense of of this is how my faith this is how my religion has had an impact on me and so Mm. i'm I'm more positive now Mm -hmm. and i have a better outlook on life which can be very good right don't get me wrong right right 
But at the same time, if we're not looking to that eternity, the, yeah. the, the picture is incomplete. Yeah. When you start to become aware of, of what's going to happen after this life and you start realizing that all of this, everything that I'm doing here, all of this spirituality that I'm, I'm growing in actually has something for me unto eternity. Mm-hmm. Oh, that changes everything. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it took five years, but there you were right. realizing that heaven is real. And and what's beautiful too is that God, the the rest of your life as you continue to walk with the Lord is just is simply Him slowly unveiling the truth and the mystery of who He is. Mm. It, like He doesn't just do it all at once. Um, like He didn't do it with the apostles. He's not going to do it with us. Like it's through this walking on this life that the Lord continues to reveal himself in the same way that he's done it in church history too. Sure. You know, like that's even just a beautiful way to think about it. Like God did not reveal completely all, like he revealed himself completely as truth, but the knowledge of what that meant took centuries. Well, well, not took centuries. Okay. The the revelation closes with the death of the last apostle. Okay. So there's no more divine revelation after the death of the last apostle. Yeah. You're better at what the words with me. So So then it's, it's not that God is continuing to reveal. It's that, Man is continuing to understand and discover. So okay. there's the, we call it the development of doctrine. There you and go. And the development of that understanding. So theological reflection happens, and we start to understand better what is contained in divine revelation. So is it right then we ourselves are just being unveiled, unveiled to this mystery? Like, yeah. So revelation is complete. Right. Uh, God has has revealed everything. Uh, but and, we do not know everything about God. Right, exactly. Yeah, so exactly. our understanding of revelation continues. But if you look at, at what all the theologians are talking about, they're not talking about something new that God has given to them. They're talking about something that is already contained in divine revelation, in right. scripture and in the tradition, that now we're understanding in a, in a deeper way, in right. a new way. Uh, so there's, it's not new revelation. It's already there, and we're understanding it. So you have that at, like, the church level, but then also how that's revealed at the individual level. Right. Which is really cool. Right, because there, there are yeah. things that, obviously, there, there are things that theologians know and can, can write about and talk about that are contained in Revelation that people have never read before. Mm-hmm. Um, there are tons of things that theologians have written that I've never read. And I have an advanced degree in theology, <laughs> right? <laughs> so there's all this stuff that's out there that I, I might not yet have been exposed to. Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't mean it's not true. It yeah. just means that I, I haven't had the, the chance to experience it yet. Yeah. But it's there. And that's part of the beauty. Now, on a personal level, as I start to discover more and more, and as I start to understand things, for me, it feels like revelation is being given to me. Mm. So my subjective experience of it mm-hmm. is this is revealed to me. Yeah. Uh, but in fact, it's already been revealed my eyes are just being open to see it. You're just catching up. My heart's being open to understand it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you live in the glory of it in heaven. That's the that's the plan. That is. So when you were a kid, what was your concept of heaven? Uh, and how has that changed? Yeah, I think the concept of heaven was pretty much what everybody's was, clouds and harps and stuff. But that's because I watched cartoons. So every time... A car- the Simpsons episode, Protestant Heaven versus Catholic I lo- Heaven. I love <laughs> that episode. No, no, more like Looney Tunes, right? Oh, okay, so yeah, every yeah. time, uh, like, every time somebody dies in a, in a Looney Tunes cartoon, <laughs> they, you, you see their soul come out of their body and yeah. float up to heaven. They have their tunic. And yeah, there's, there's a halo and there's, there's wings and there's, there's a harp. And, and that's pretty much it. Yeah. And then there's usually a fight between them in heaven about something because like you, you blew me up. Uh, it, was, <laughs> it was because of the anvil that you dropped on me that we're both here now, something like that. Yeah. Uh, so those kinds of things, like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a popular imagination for it. Um, but it was as I, as I got a little bit older, um, particularly I think like around middle school. So when I started realizing that, that, that was an image of heaven that as nice as it looked, it wasn't real. Mm. And then especially in high school, when I started to really dive into my faith and understand my faith and understand that, that hell was an actual possibility. That was when I started to to think, oh, I've got to think differently. So I remember actually in high school watching a movie, um, where, somebody who had just been like shooting at people died. And I thought to myself, this is a movie character, an actor who is still alive today. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But in, in my mind, as I watched the scene, I thought, I wonder if that guy went to heaven or not. Mm. And it wasn't a true story. Mm -hmm. So it has, there's, it's a fictitious story, (laughs) a fictional character. There's nothing about this that was real, but I remember like thinking that. And to this day, I will still think that way sometimes if there's a death scene in a movie. Mm. I go, did that person get to heaven? Mm. 
because I started to become more aware of, of the reality of, of what heaven really is. Now, one of the things that's always been challenging for me when I talk to, especially to like middle school kids about heaven and the idea of, of heaven is, is difficult because they're like, is there Xbox in heaven? Uh, <laughs> will I be able to, to have pizza in heaven? Like yeah. they're, they're talking about their favorite things and the stuff that they really like yeah. to do. And again, this is, this is a consequence of just, we can't imagine fully what eternity is. Yeah. So we think we tend to think of it in terms of a very, very long time. Mm-hmm. We don't realize that it's something completely outside of time. Uh, and so if we're thinking in terms of hours that we have to spend, then I don't want those hours to be spent in a boring way. Right. <laughs> I don't want to be bored in heaven. And so I, I would just hope that all the cool stuff that I like to do is there. Yeah. So I hope that video games are there. I, I hope that I can play my favorite sport. I hope that I can watch my favorite TV show. I hope that all my friends are there and there's going to be this, this sense. And that's great. We, it's not bad to, to think that way, mm-hmm. but we tend to think maybe in too earthly terms about what heaven's going to be. Yeah. And so trying to, to communicate to our middle school kids or to high school kids that no, in fact, heaven is the, the perfect fulfillment of all desire. Yeah. It, that's really hard. So actually this, this popular image of, of clouds and harps and all that stuff is, is really nice, but then it gets really destructive. Okay. I'm going to, I got to go. I got to yeah. go on this. Like, Cause the, oh, <laughs> the really destructive thing that, that drives me nuts is deconstruct is, this. Well, that image that we get, we get our, our, our harp and our halo and, and we're good to go the really destructive thing is that we think we turn into angels. Oh my gosh, yes, but, no. But we don't. We don't. Because angels are incorporeal beings yeah. created by God for his service and for the protection of humanity. I'm really glad you mentioned this. Angels are, are, are incredibly powerful spiritual beings and they're beautiful. Yeah. But we, created in the image and likeness of God and incarnate, given a body, we're going to share in the resurrection. Yeah. So we, unlike angels will share in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We will share in the bodily resurrection. The angels won't. Yeah. So the idea that we would surrender the body mm-hmm. to become an angel when we get to heaven actually becomes an, an unconscious and unintentional denial of the resurrection of the dead. Mm-hmm. No, we're going to rise again and be, be in this body. We'll have the glorified body. Right. And that think of this. God, perfectly sufficient in himself, perfectly happy in himself, perfect in himself, chooses to take on our human flesh, yeah. chooses to enter creation, the act of love to enter the, the depths of his creation. And so to give himself to us so completely and so perfectly, and then to allow us to keep this part of our creation as a sign of love and as a sign of our union with him, mm. that is so much better than I'm going to die and turn into an angel. <laughs> Like, I'm sorry, the love of God that is so infinite and so powerful and so beautiful will allow me to then share completely in that love, in this body. He united himself to me in this body when he took on our human flesh and was born in Nazareth, in Bethlehem. <laughs> I got to know where I am. <laughs> Do you know your story? <laughs> I know my story. But that power that, that, he yeah. was, that he was born, that he came into this world, that, that he experienced everything that we can experience, including our death. And then raised this body up. Right. That's what we're going to share in. Yeah. That's the, what we believe we will experience. So the idea that I would become an angel isn't true. However, why do we say somebody has become an angel? Why is that such a popular thing? It's because we understand the communion of saints. Mm. We're just mixing up the, the, the language. What I want is to be a saint. Yeah. And what I want is for the people who I love and who I know to be saints, which means I want them to go to heaven. So when someone dies, I don't want them to be an angel. I want them to be a saint who will intercede for me. Exactly. Because the saints can intercede for us in a way that the angels can't. Because they, they, they speak as, as one with us, sharing in our human nature, being one of us, being a human being mm-hmm. like us. When Their, their prayers are, are distinct from the prayers of, of the angels. Yeah. And then in also... Humans are made higher than the angels. Like, we, like, that's incredible. Didn't Maximilian Colby say this, that if angels could be jealous of man for one reason, it's because we could receive Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. Yeah. Like, that alone. I mean, I don't know if it was Maximilian Colby who said that, but yes, I've heard that exact saying. Okay. Yes. I don't know. I think I'm associating with Maximilian Colby. I don't know. I'm okay with that. Well, you know, he's a great guy. Um, this is a swell fella. <laughs> What's that Christmas movie that people where he he gets an he gets his angel's wings? Um, 
It's a wonderful life. It's a wonderful yeah, life. Did when, that people just that when, that just when Clarence gets his wings? Right, exactly. That's what I'm, I'm just saying. Well, and, and there's there's sort of the the sense that angels have to fly, but angels are incorporeal beings. So they, they, wings are corporeal. Wings are a physical attribute. Right. And they, angels they, do not have physical attributes, though in scripture angels take the form of someone or something so that they can be seen. Yeah. Angels are pure spiritual beings. Now this is where okay you could get into like angelology. Okay, so we're gonna do a lot of Saint, Saint Thomas Aquinas on this. Well, e- e- even even others. Than St. Thomas, like the the study of angels is is actually a whole discipline within theology. I believe it. That's there's, so there's cool. There's a whole there's whole things that you can do to talk about that. It's very powerful, very beautiful. But we do not share in angelic nature. No, we we are not called to be angels. No, no. And the fact that they are here to serve us and they pray for us, um, that they're more interested in our salvation than sometimes we are. That was a kicker for me when someone said that to me especially as a missionary, like Paula, you think you're actually really invested in this person's salvation. The angels are way more invested well, in think this. About it. The angels have already made their eternal choice for God. Yeah. And they are not in need of salvation. No. We are continuing to grow. We are continuing to seek the Lord. And so our experience of uh, of God is is distinct from the experience of God that the angels have. The angels already worship night and day before his throne. They're trying to help us on the road to salvation. Mm-hmm. And what are they trying to do? They're hoping that we say yes to an eternal relationship with right. God. Exactly. And, and that's what heaven is. So I'm going to read this part from the catechism. This is chapter, this is paragraph 221. Heaven is ultimately about us being in perfect union with the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who is a relationship. But St. John goes even further when he affirms that God is love. God's very being is love. By sending his son and the spirit of love and the fullness of time, God has revealed his innermost secret. God himself is an internal exchange of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he has destined us to share in that exchange. I remember hearing that for the first time, and I was like, what? Like, that's it? That's all heaven is? Like, I don't mean like, that's it. I mean like, whoa, I was so wrong about what my purpose was. Um, Because if you know that's what heaven is, that is your invitation here on earth is to actually be in the middle of this eternal exchange of love. Yeah. For me to know that I am loved. Eternal, perfect, unselfish, totally free exchange of love. Yeah. And that's what gives meaning to our life. That's what gives purpose. Like when you live out of this. So then what you have to think about is what happens when you receive love? When, when you're on the receiving end of someone else's love for you, mm-hmm. what happens to your heart? What happens to you? You you feel built up. You feel happy, right? Yeah. What happens when you're able to love in return? Same. The same thing. Yeah. So think of that for all eternity, except in a perfect way. Mm-hmm. So my ability to love someone is conditioned by my limitations, by my flaws. Mm-hmm. Um, by my mood on a given day. I mean, that's right? a real thing, yeah. My ability to receive love yeah. is conditioned by my sinfulness, by my flaws, by my mood on a given day, but also by the other person's mm-hmm. mood, flaws, etc. And so when I am, am trying to be loving towards someone or when someone is trying to be loving towards me, there's all these things that can kind of get in the way. Uh, and yet still I feel affirmed. Yet still I feel peace, happiness, joy, still I feel like this is this is the kind of thing that I, I want to stay in. Like, can you stay so, in that forever, though? That's crazy. Can you stand it in no, a perfect way? Right, right, right. Like, like That's how can mean. you contain it? Right. You know what I'm saying? I saw this quote the other day. This is the reason we laugh is because our bodies cannot contain joy. Yeah. And I thought that was so beautiful. Well, but in heaven, like... Think of that. That's the reason that creation exists. Yeah. Because God's love is perfect in itself, but that eternal relationship of love is is so great that it pours out in the act of creation exactly that that love is is constantly being poured out and shared because it cannot be contained mm-hmm. instead that divine love needs, needs to always be given and always be shared right just like sit with that for a second it's very powerful yeah how can you not be overwhelmed in the most magnificent way you just be like god this is what's been waiting for me the whole time 
the entire time. <laughs> and here I got distracted with a thousand other little things. Right. You know? Um, but this is what Jesus constantly is doing in, in scriptures. And I, um, I finally watched the first season of Chosen. The Chosen. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you watch it yet? I haven't, I haven't seen it yet. No. I haven't seen it. Some parent was like, have you watched it yet? And people I was keep like, saying great things. I have I, oh. I have no reason to doubt that the people who tell me that it's great are, yeah. are telling the truth. And every review that I've heard and, and read is, is really good. I just haven't had a chance to sit down and actually do it yet. I finally I finally did. And I was crying at every episode. And I was like, well, of course I do, because that's what I do. Where, where, Father Sam, where is it to be found? So you can actually download The Chosen app. Um, oh, there's and a it's, whole app for it's it. It's a whole app for it. Okay. Completely free. Uh, if you find on um, Peacock, it, there was only the first season. Okay. But you have to go back to the app for the second season. Interesting. And they're in the midst of finishing up the third season. Okay. Uh, but what I loved about this, it's everyday Jesus. Because in these other movies about Jesus, it's like the highlights. <laughs> like, here's yeah. the highlight reel about he, these miracles and his death and his resurrection. This was, oh, I wonder what it was like for Jesus to travel between all these towns. And he's just chatting with his apostles. And then you just see him doing his, his work. Um, he's eating. Like, he's just, he's just being. But how he tries to speak to the people to elevate their minds and hearts. Here's what you're looking for. Like, this, he's in the world, Right. But he's, but he's constantly in conversation with heaven. Mm. And and it was just so beautiful to, to, I think there was a quote, yeah, like, walk on earth but have your heart in heaven. Like, do I live that on an everyday basis? Yeah. You know, and there's sometimes that I that, that that really does happen to me. If if I'm working, all of a sudden my, my heart is just overjoyed with the concept of heaven and um, that I'm doing some work as I'm working, like this is heaven's work and I'm being a part of it, yeah. you know? And, and, and there's moments like that where I'll get those throughout the day. And then other moments that I'm just like, well, I really don't feel like doing anything today. Um, but it's just amazing how the soul is being formed to have an eternal perspective and to look forward to that, honestly, yeah. actually, to wake up and be like, okay, Jesus, like, give me your eyes, give me your hands, help me to, to constantly think of you. Um, so it, it, it really is amazing. But just seeing that, the eternal exchange of love, and I think this is where relationship with the Holy Spirit is so powerful. Uh, as I got to know the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit really accelerated more deeply my relationship with the Father and the Son. Hmm. Like it actually caught me up into this relationship with to know who Jesus is as my savior and to know who God the Father is as my Abba. Uh, some of us are kind of walking on just like, okay, I kind of know the Father a little bit or I kind of know Jesus, but I don't really have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. I think we really want that complete, well, we're going to have that complete experience of it in heaven, but just a greater depth of this eternal exchange of love. Like we need to have a relationship with all three. Yeah. And so this is actually, you're seeing like the limitation of our, our humanity. Yeah. So in my humanity and my weakness, I'm not able to, I'm not able to see as fully as it is the union of the blessed Trinity. Yeah. And so my tendency is going to be to, to intellectually sort of separate the three persons. I know that the three persons of the blessed Trinity, God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy spirit are perfectly united in a perfect unity of divinity, uh, co-equal, co-eternal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like I know that intellectually, Yeah. but in order for my tiny brain to figure this stuff all out, I have to think about separately God the Father, mm -hmm. God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so that means that even when I pray, I'm going to, while I do pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and there is that unity, I'm also going to kind of tend to pray more in very specific ways to individual persons of the Blessed Trinity. Yeah. Almost forgetting, not really forgetting and not denying, but almost forgetting that when I speak to the Father... I am speaking to the Trinity. When mm. I speak to Jesus, I am speaking to the Trinity. Mm. When I speak to the Holy Spirit, I am speaking to the Trinity. Um, I love the the prayer, the breastplate of Saint Patrick, because mm. it begins with that that the, that phrase: "I bind unto myself today the strong name of the Trinity." Mm. And then it just kind of keeps going with this 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 beautiful reflection on on what that eternal three in one 
is yeah. and what that union means. And so to bind onto myself today the name of the Trinity means that I, I'm not going to just focus on one thing or another or like think I've got to have a specific relationship here and there. Rather, I'm just like the whole Trinity. Just give me everything, Jesus. <laughs> like, Lord, I, I want all I want the of whole you. thing. I want the whole divinity. Yeah. yeah. And there's a beauty in that. But in our smallness mm-hmm. and in our limitations, sometimes we need to focus. So come Holy Spirit becomes the prayer. Yeah. Because I I need the I know I know that the Holy Spirit does certain things. Mm-hmm. So I need the power of the Holy Spirit. Other times it's crying out to Jesus for his mercy, for his grace, for his help. Other other times calling out to the Father. Mm -hmm. Lord, I need need a father right now. And And all of those are necessary too. Yeah, exactly. It's both and people, both and. Right on. (laughs) Uh, It's so good. So here's the next thing that I want to bring up. Uh, This is from the catechism again. But before... Perhaps the reason why sometimes we don't contemplate heaven enough is I want to challenge this. Like we don't desire it. Mm-hmm. We, you know, I'm not going to think of something that I don't desire. If I don't desire it, why is that? You know, and the catechism really points to this reality. Like if I want to increase my desire for heaven, it's because of conversion. Mm. Um, so it says this. He says. The desire for heaven is the fruit of conversion. The catechism teaches that conversion is accomplished in daily life by gestures of reconciliation, concern for the poor, the exercise and defense of justice and right, by the admission of faults to one's brethren, fraternal correction, revision of life, examination of conscience, spiritual direction, acceptance of suffering, endurance of persecution for the sake of righteousness, taking up one's cross each day, and following Jesus is the surest way of penance. Mm. So I think this is where we, we start to see part of the challenge. So modern man doesn't do a great job at examination. No. We don't do a great, exo- a great job examining our lives and our consciences. We definitely don't do a great job uh, accepting fraternal correction. And we don't do a good job of accepting suffering. Mm-mm. So our tendency is to avoid suffering at all costs, mm-hmm. uh, do whatever is going to, to feel good and make, and make me happy. And then, uh, yeah, no, no one has the right to tell me that I'm, that I'm wrong. Mm. When we live that way and we're avoiding it, it, we get so focused on this world and we get so focused on ourselves that it's not that we don't have a desire for heaven. It's that because we're so focused on the things here and now, how can I avoid suffering? How can I uh, live my life with as little criticism as possible? Mm -hmm. And how can I defend myself against anyone who might criticize me? Mm. Right? If I'm I'm living that way, then I'm not really thinking of eternity. I'm thinking of my next move. Right. I'm thinking one, maybe two steps ahead. If I'm, if I'm really smart, I might think as far as 10 steps ahead, but much beyond that is, is really difficult. Mm-hmm. But I'm always focused on the steps ahead. I'm not focused on the biggest part of the picture, which is eternity with God. So in a way, you kind of silenced your desire, like you're unaware of it because you've covered up with so many other yeah. external things. I replace the desire for what is eternal yeah. with the desire for what is temporal. Yeah. And so I would rather have the tangible benefit of... Uh, friendship and wealth and pleasure and everything here and now than the intangible, as of yet, benefit of eternity in heaven. And that's the argument that I hear of modern man. Yeah. Why should I subject myself to the church's teachings and all of this if I'm going to die? Well, Why not take and, in all of these experiences now right. if by the end of it, you know? It, so, often, so it's fascinating. Yeah, and, and the modern world would on, only look at this and see... This means denying myself. Right. This this means denying myself good things or things that I want, and that sort of self denial doesn't doesn't make any sense. Except that, uh, look at all the all the fitness magazines and everything, and they're they're all talking about intermittent fasting and <laughs> denying yourself and having this sort of discipline, and every sort of corporate structure requires self discipline and mm-hmm. self denial so that you can keep moving forward, so that your career can keep advancing. Everything, even about. Uh, Going to college, getting into college means I have to deny myself yeah. certain activities so that I can spend more time studying or more time participating in this activity or that activity so that the college will pay attention to me and notice me and, and want me. 
Um, so the, the spirit of self-denial is not absent from us. It's right. just that we so often misdirect it. Or misdirect isn't even the right word because there's nothing wrong with trying to advance in, in your chosen career or mm-hmm. trying to get into college. Those are all good things. They're all, they're all positive things, mm-hmm. right? But if I'm not willing to deny myself for the sake of something greater, right. a spiritual reality greater than my, my present earthly reality, then I'm always going to find myself sort of dissatisfied and, and unhappy. Right. So whether you're a student or you're working or you're doing just everyday life, our purpose is all the same equally is, can I aim this towards heaven? Yeah. You're going to find your joy in those monotonous things that you have to do. Yeah. And then that's where, so this idea from the catechism of revision of life. Mm-hmm. So revision of life means both looking at my life again, revisioning my life. Uh, re-examining my, what my life looks like and, and how I'm living it. But also a revision of life means correcting things in myself, in my own life. And so often we, we think once I've made a choice, I have to make that choice forever. And I have to, I have to live in this way. So if, if I've mm-hmm. chosen to, to do something, like I've chosen to grow a beard, Mm-hmm. And there's a part of me that feels like I have to have a beard forever now. I had a dream that your beard was gone. Yeah, don't have those dreams. <laughs> like, don't, don't have those kinds of dreams. But there's, this was in the last couple of weeks. But, like, <laughs> but really, truly, there's this this part of me that goes, do I have to have a beard forever now? Oh, will there Will there ever be a time when I'm clean shaven again? Because I made a choice to have a beard, and now I'm now I'm I'm a man with a beard. That's part of that's part of my identity. That's part of who I am. Yeah. Um, now, it, let's say that this was something that was sinful that I was doing. Right? Mm-hmm. Like growing a beard is, is not sinful. Right. It is at at, at worst, it's amoral. <laughs> I, I personally think it happens to be virtuous. Uh, it's, it's, as, uh, it's okay. Saint, a lot of saints as as, would the, agree. as the Franciscan community says, the the beard is a sign of manly austerity and imitation of Christ. And uh, for the people who can't grow a beard, <laughs> what of them? Friars will look scruffy. I believe that the that that is what it says <laughs> as a, as a sign of humility. So it helps them to grow in the virtue of humility. Like we're just going uh, from that. Okay. But anyway, so. Beards are, are virtuous and wonderful, uh, but let's say that I had chosen to to do something that was that was not virtuous, that was not helpful, um, and so the things that I was doing were actually destructive to to my soul. But I start thinking, but I've this is this is now how I'm known. Mm. I'm known for doing this thing and for behaving in this way. Is there any escape? And so often we think, no, that's that's just who I am. That's just what I am. Mm-hmm. So we define ourselves by by sin, whether we are willing to acknowledge it as sin or not. Oh, yeah. We think, but I like this. This makes me feel good, so I'm going to continue doing it. Yeah. So revision of life doesn't really come in. But like, you ever talk to somebody who has stopped drinking, for example? Mm-hmm. Have you ever met somebody who criticizes that person because they made a decision to stop drinking? No. 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 Universally, we go, great. Yeah, that's the decision that you felt like you need you needed to make for yourself, or there's good reason, health reasons, um, yeah, moral reasons, whatever it might be. You made a choice. I support you in making that choice because it was not an easy choice for you to make, but yeah. I, I want to support you. And now that's not going to be something that defines you. I also don't want to define you just by like, oh, he's a guy who doesn't drink. Yeah, <laughs> now, yeah. <laughs> now I, I want to see you for who you really are. Yeah. That revision of life, though, allows you to now be more fully yourself. Mm. When I revise my behavior, my attitudes towards things, I grow. Right. But so often we don't have a growth mentality when it comes to what we're going to do. We just think, I'm going to express what I want. Yeah. I'm going to do whatever yeah. I want. You're reorienting back to heaven. If we're able to have that spiritual mindset, yes, we're reorienting mm-hmm. back to heaven. I think if we have at least a an authentically human mindset, mm. we can recognize that you know, part of the human experience is revision of life. Part yeah. of the human experience is examination of conscience. That's that's a necessary part of the human experience. So at least on the natural level, we're able to say, I need to change, I need to grow. Yeah. And these things are actually good for me. Um, then if we're able to have that spiritual outlook, and, and we really ought to have that spiritual outlook. And I think actually the more we live by our human nature, the more authentically we're living out our human nature – the more we become in touch with that spiritual side of who we are, the more the spiritual right. life makes sense because we realize that the spiritual life is an essential component of human nature. Yeah. Yeah. This is really good. So I'm going to move on to what C.S. Lewis says because okay. this has to do, as you're talking about, revision of life. I aiming. love C.S. Lewis. I mean, everything he says is great. He's great. So he says, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. Mm. Isn't that great? It's so perfect. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. 
it, it doesn't take <sighs> much. We just look at history. Yeah. If we look at history, we see that that quest for power. Um, you know, Nietzsche talks about it as the will to power that that everyone has, but the will to power, as as Nietzsche describes it, ultimately always ends up giving us nothing. Mm-hmm. And it's it's sort of almost the source of all misery, mm-hmm. all, all human dysfunction, is from that. Like I have to be dominant. I have to win. Right. Right. And so kind of like the rich young man yeah. that the, the priest that had me pray with, I was so consumed with earthly things is literally why he sent it to me. <laughs> um, but again, like I was just aiming at earth. I was just trying to get it to the next, the next step. Right. And the Lord was like, actually, no, I have more planned for you. And think all the countless examples that we have from history of, of people who are by their greed, by their insistence on this they're, they're just grasping at stuff here and now right yeah. in the same way that eve was just grasping in the garden for the future because she's like well father i don't think you can provide for me right. so her grasping at the future we do this we grasp at the future afraid to because we can't live in the present right you know um so and sister josephine you don't know her i don't know sister josephine she's great okay but I we heard this you. talk and one thing i want to know what your thoughts are on this because she said this the other day and i was like wow this is amazing um she said that we need to think about ourselves not as having a relationship with god but that we are a relationship with god in the sense that if god ever stopped thinking about us for one second mm-hmm. we would just cease to exist I don't just simply have a relationship with God. Like I literally am a relationship with God in the same way that I am like a part of this Trinitarian relationship. And that's what heaven is. And that was like so mind opening. Like it was so beautiful. I'm like, no, this is what I am. Like I am a relationship. I am made out of communion, um, out of an eternal love. That's who I am. And when I, when I live outside of that or just kind of like put in a nice little box over here, Man, it just, it's not good. <laughs> it gets really hard to live. Yeah. But if I live from a place of knowing that I am, I'm eternally loved, that just, and that, that, the idea of being eternally loved, that has really, oh, let's say the last three years, that started solidifying in my heart about three years ago. Good. You know, again, this is like, <laughs> 10 years after saying yes to Jesus, but like how beautiful God is like, no, like you are eternally loved. And I know that now. And I, and I can sit in that. And that is my foundation for how, like I wake up in the day, like I'm eternally loved. Um, so it's just beautiful. I I simply don't have a relationship with God. I I am like, I'm his, like I, I, I'm completely his. I'm made in his image and likeness. It just continues. And something else that she had said that was really powerful is that God is an eternal now. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was saying this in co- in context of like discernment, how we're kind of like either looking too much in the past, looking too much into the future, and then forgetting that God isn't eternal now. Like God is going to give you everything you need now, you know, today in the same way that he gave manna to the Israelites in the desert. Like here's enough bread for today. Right. Like, can I live in, in this relationship where like I'm waking up in this, this morning knowing that I'm eternally loved and God is going to give me all the graces that I need to live out today in union with him. Even in the midst of like some interruptions or things like that, God is still going to give me everything that I need because he is eternally present here now. I don't, you know, there might be times in my life where I, I'm in like expectation of certain things, but most of the time, all the time is he's still providing for me like today at this very moment, I'm alive because he's thinking about me. Right. And it just, oh my gosh, if we could just sit in that, it changes everything. It truly changes everything. Yeah. So thanks for talking about heaven with me. Hey, that's great. Um, you know, speaking of the eternal now, um, Duke is sitting outside this, this room and he keeps barking at me. <laughs> I know, I, I saw. Uh, yeah, he, want, he wants to get in because, but like, think of it, he's... He's a dog, so he lives in the eternal present. He, he, <laughs> yeah. has, he has no sense of the past and no sense of the future. He's just like, hey, right now, hey, hey, are you paying attention to me? Hey, <laughs> hey, hey. But, Terry had to come interrupt. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a great um, there's a great poem called "The Hound of Heaven," mm. and it's about the idea that God pursues us, 
and that the hound of heaven is constantly chasing us. Mm. And at first it can feel scary. Like God so badly wants to be in a relationship with me that he's chasing me, that he's <laughs> after me, he's trying to get me. But it's not, it's not in a negative way. It's in this incredibly beautiful way that, that the Lord so desires relationship with me that he will never stop pursuing me. He'll never stop coming after me. Yeah. Um, and because in his eternal present, he's always at work, always seeking me, then he's, he's going to never stop yeah. Never stop looking for me. Never stop seeking me out. And so Duke is sitting out there, never stopping to seek me out. He just wants me out of this. So in room other words, so that I can we need in. to be more like Duke. <laughs> yeah, but in that relationship with God, right? So like as as we know, the Lord is always looking for us. God always wants to be in that relationship with us. Well, just so today would be a good day for us to turn and, and look at Him. Yeah, and say, all right, Lord, I do want to be with you. I do want to have that union with you and I, and I want to grow in that in that relationship mm-hmm. yeah it's good so so cool together let's aim at heaven and we will get earth thrown in um, aim at earth and we are just not gonna get either <laughs> yes yeah, so we're, we're sticking at aiming at heaven it's much better <laughs> much awesome better. all right well this is we're like the lamb i'm Bella Binya. i'm father sam kachuba god bless you <laughs>